lucky Qua Vares Tourism Series. Welcome everybody. Welcome to everybody listening on YouTube. Welcome to all the registered participants from our mm -hmm. member states. Welcome to our fantastic panelists that are going to be entertaining us today. I should really say this word on a very, very important topic. We, um, this is a webinar, one of these webinars that, you know, sometimes when you think about it, you might reflect and say, okay, this is really delicate stuff. This is really important. How can we make it appealing so that people really start thinking about it and governments and stakeholders in the tourism industry start understanding that maybe we're not far from reaching a solution? Because what happened during this pandemic? This pandemic basically unsettled all of us. We all found ourselves in a different, I would say, lifestyle model, uh, even the way we looked at uh, the normal things that were uh, part of our daily routine completely changed. And of course, we are not just uh, working in the tourism industry, we're also people, all of us. And we are definitely consumers. So we are entitled to our rights and probably what is interesting is that tourism is such a, a widespread and I always refer to as a very thick industry with many layers, right? And one of the biggest layers is actually a very personal layer and the one that really pertains our choice of, of travel, our, you know, uh, whether we're taking a, a, a family vacation, whether we're just going to visit people, whether we're going to our dream uh, holiday, whether we're doing a business trip. And while we're doing that, we need to remind ourselves that we have rights. The moment that we write a contract, we, which is a travel contract or which is a, a, a residence contract for a hotel or anything like that, we're actually entitled to rights. So what happened during this COVID-19 is that everything was completely unsettled. A little bit of an earthquake and a, of a tsunami that happened in that platform. So now we are, uh, so lucky that we are re initiating this very, I would say, very crucial conversation because we are now uh, in a position where definitely we need to think of all the aspects of what consumer rights and tourism uh, imply and what are the issues that COVID-19 has brought to life. Ultimately, if there is any solution, we're not in, of course, for a definitive solution, but we might be positively surprised. So. Once again, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Alessandro Priante. I'm the director of the Regional Department of Europe at the UNWTO. And today, with this uh, very interesting topic, I have the absolute pleasure and honor to be cited by uh, Alicia Gomez, who's not only a fantastic colleague and friend, but she also definitely the legal counsel of UNWTO, a person that we all, uh, admire, respect, and sometimes fear. Uh, so she's uh, an integral part of our of our uh, uh, organization, who will be um, moderating a discussion with three amazing panelists. And thank you really very much all for participating, also from different parts of the world. We're going to be jo joined in by Sarah Prager, who is the chair of the Travel and Tourism Lawyers Association of Eng England and Wales. Of we're going to be, uh, uh, there's Daniela De La Rosa, who's going to be joining us uh, from Italy, from Milano, if I'm uh, not mistaken. And she's a partner at Cur Curtis Corporate International, but has a, a large experience, uh, especially with the European institutions, exactly on this topic. And last but not least, by Michael uh, Vukosic, who is the president, a former president of International Forum of Travel and Tourism Advocates, which is IFTA from 2008 to 2016. So without any further ado, I will pass the floor to my colleague Alicia, but I would like to remind you that I will be, of course, just like all of you watching and uh, taking my notes, but please start writing a lot of questions, whether on YouTube or on uh, the Zoom itself. We will make sure to collect all of them as we normally do, and we will try to feed in at some point of the discussion to have some of your questions answered or maybe to throw some further challenges for our fantastic speakers and panelists of today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia. And uh, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Good afternoon, everyone. 
And thank you uh, for hosting this webinar, but also for taking the lead in picking up this very uh, important topic and bringing, bringing, bringing it up at the forefront of UNWTO's efforts to restore uh, tourism confidence. So I've had a great pleasure in discussing this topic with you. And I'm very happy that today uh, we have these fantastic panelists. It's a true privilege for us. We're delighted to have you. And uh, for me personally, it's an honor too, um, as I've read you and I've followed you. So um, to be discussing this with uh, lawyers that I admire and I respect, I'm sure I'm gonna be learning uh, quite a lot, uh, probably as much as our viewers. Uh, so also hello to all our member states and all the viewers uh, who are watching us. And before we start engaging in the discussion with the panelists, I would like very briefly just to um, set a little bit the framework for uh, this discussion. I will just, uh, I hope you see my presentation. Yes, it's there on the screen. So um, let me just explain a little bit. A lot is being said right now uh, about restoring the trust of the tourists um, in terms of establishing health and security protocols. But we believe uh, at UNWTO that we need to go beyond that. And we also need to restore the confidence of tourists as consumers. Uh, so I will just go a little bit into the details as to the perspective of the tourists of the crisis, how they've lived the crisis, and uh, how we may move forward in restoring their confidence. During the COVID-19 crisis, we have all witnessed how tourists have suffered uh, the following situation. Uh, the closure of borders with little or no notice, leaving them no time at all to react. Uh, we've seen how millions of tourists were stranding during the stranded during the crisis, and they have suffered a very different luck and treatment depending on their nationality, but also uh, on the destination. Uh, we've seen outbreaks in cruises, in resorts, in hotels, leading to sometimes very dramatic situations for the tourists. There was an absolute lack of information and clarity as to who is responsible for what. We've seen tourists uh, sometimes with limited access to accommodation and public health in the destinations in which they were locked down. Uh, millions of flights were canceled, and here too we've seen uh, very different treatments, even within the European Union, where we have directives on consumer rights protection. We've seen countries taking unilateral decisions, um, the famous um, vouchers instead of the reimbursement, which have led to a big confusion uh, in the tourists. And uh, finally, when tourists have tried to resort to their travel and health insurances, they discover that these do not cover force majeure situations, such as this pandemic. So these um, situations have been all over the news and we've all been following them. Uh, they have brought to light uh, the absence of international rules to assist tourists in emergency situations. They have also brought to light uh, the absence of harmonization in terms of consumer rights protection worldwide. And uh, also for the tourists, they have revealed to the tourists his uh, deep vulnerability as a consumer. Um, when tourism is uh, resumed and the borders are open again, and this is going to happen uh, very soon, we are going to be talking about traveling with the virus, at least for some time. And of course, that entails a lot of risks to, for the tourists in terms, uh, especially when we know that there might be a second wave or an outbreak almost. Um, it could happen uh, anywhere and at any time. So in order for a tourist to uh, travel again abroad, uh, the tourist needs to have trust in the destination, in the country of destination that this country will take care uh, of him, but also on his own country of residence and on the cooperation between the two. Also, the tourist needs to be reassured and have clarity as to the responsibilities of the different uh, tourism stakeholders that are involved when planning a trip. In this sense, uh, we believe um, that the way forward to rebuild trust in tourists as consumers could be taken in two steps. In the first step, we think it's urgent and it's essential to adopt a minimum set of international standards on assistance and protection of tourists in emergency situations that would also clarify what are their 
the minimum tourism consumer rights that they may expect uh, in force majeure situations. And in a second step, we believe it's very important um, to harmonize and develop international standards on tourism consumer protection. We know that new uh, health protocols and new security measures are going to be adopted, and these are going to imply new obligations for the tourists. Now, these need to go hand in hand also with rights for the tourists and uh, with clear expectations. Uh, we cannot uh, expect tourists to have to study the legislation of the countries uh, where, where they intend to travel or to have to hire a lawyer in order to assist them whenever they're reviewing an accommodation contract or, um, or a contract with an airline. So it is important that all of the measures that we take, the health, the security protocols, but also the rights of the tourists in these situations and in the post-COVID-19 are harmonized. So through these two steps, we're aiming at developing an international code on the protection of tourists that could provide sufficient guarantees for the post-COVID-19 uh, scenario. These minimum standards should include at least uh, the following responsibilities and obligations. Uh, who is responsible for providing up-to-date information to the tourists during a crisis? Uh, also, the responsibilities and obligations in terms of providing basic assistance to tourists, food, shelter, communication, and access to health facilities. What happens if there are cancellations in the case of force majeure situations? Also, what are the obligations uh, among states in terms of providing consular visa and repatriation facilities? What happens if the service provider becomes insolvent? Um, while uh, the, the, the tourist is stranded because of an emergency situation. And finally, also establishing alternative dispute resolution mechanisms that could uh, help tourists have their rights restored in a more efficient and fast uh, manner as the traditional judicial uh, mechanisms are probably not uh, efficient uh, when we're talking about an emergency situation or so the situations that we've uh, seen during the COVID-19 crisis. UNWTO has been working uh, for quite a long time in the development of these standards since uh, 2012. After the crisis of the Icelandic volcano in uh, 2010, we have been working uh, together with 36 member states and also with um, international organizations, with ICAO, uh, also with IATA, uh, with IFTA too. So Michael, I think, is very familiar with the work that we did for many years uh, in trying to develop um, some um, uh, rules on the assistance uh, to tourists in emergency situations, but also trying to set some international standards on consumer protection rights. And we uh, try to achieve, uh, um, the, we try to clarify what could be, what should be the obligations and the rights of tourists, of service providers and of states during emergency, trying to provide a fair and balanced share of responsibilities, also to enforce international cooperation for the assistance and repatriation of tourists in emergency situations. And we also, there were also two annexes that um, touch upon quite a lot on consumer rights protection. So a preliminary proposal uh, was in fact adopted by our General Assembly in uh, 2017. And there is a draft text that was even endorsed by our General Assembly. Of course, this uh, work needs to be reviewed and adjusted to the very uh, special circumstances that we are facing. But there is a lot of material and a lot of work that had been done. And so we believe that uh, we could use it in order to issue immediate guidance to our member states in terms of uh, standards on the assistance of tourists in emergency situations, but also that this work could serve as the basis to develop an international code on the protection of tourists. And that this could be uh, another pillar, which we see as an essential and also an unav unavoidable one uh, in the post COVID-19 uh, scenario in order if we, if we want to restore uh, tourists' uh, confidence and uh, to clarify what are their consumer rights. So now having said this, I will now turn to the real experts that uh, we have today. And uh, I, I, I 
I actually designed two set of questions. The first one would be uh, more based on uh, the assistance to tourists in emergency situations and how to rebuild uh, trust in this um, phase where um, uh, borders are being open, uh, but we know that there might be another emergency uh, arising uh, at any time and almost anywhere. So um, the first block of questions would be on that. And the second one would be more focused on consumer protection rights and especially the um, vouchers versus the refund and all the situations that we've seen and, and its legal implications. So for the first set of questions, uh, Michael, if you allow me, I would like to start uh, by as asking the ladies. Uh, I would like to ask first Sarah. Um, we've discussed a lot and, uh, and I've also listened to you very carefully. Um, but I would like to know in your views, what minimum measures do you think that states uh, should be put in place that states should put in place in the short term to generate confidence for international tourists within or coming to Europe? Um, is it, what do you think that has failed the most perhaps during the crisis, the information to tourists, uh, basic assistance in terms of food, shelter, access to health, uh, perhaps having an international center where tourists could call in case of need and also, do you think that these measures could be harmonized? Do you uh, foresee any impediments? Well, that's a big question. Uh, um, I think at the moment, one of the major problems is that nobody's booking holidays at the moment because everyone's too nervous um, to book a holiday because uh, we don't know what's going to happen. If there's, there's a lot of talk, certainly in England, about a second spike, what will happen if uh, because a lot of the countries in Europe are coming out of lockdown in a very um, disorganized way. So they're all coming out of lockdown in different ways. And in some countries, I know everything is open now. Um, in England, we're kind of halfway through coming out of lockdown. So some school years are back, but not all of them. Um, some shops are open, but not all of them. Uh, things like hairdressers and, and things like that are not open yet. I know that in other parts of Europe, more, more things are open. In other parts, fewer things are open. So it's a very piecemeal picture that we're seeing here. And certainly for, for English tourists, um, it's very difficult to be confident about booking a holiday at the moment. Um, the first thing is that our Foreign and Commonwealth Office is uh, telling us not to travel. So we're being recommended that we should not travel unless it's essential. So we should not be booking holidays anyway. Um, one of the other problems is that while that um, advice remains in play, we can't get insurance to travel. So it means that um, if you do book a holiday and you do go away now as an English tourist, you will not be insured if something goes wrong. So even if you were to have, let's say it was not COVID-19 related at all, even if you had a, a traffic accident during the course of your holiday, um, you wouldn't be covered by insurance. So you couldn't get back, you couldn't get treatment, um, um, except under the EHIC scheme in, in Europe. So there's no consumer confidence at all in the travel industry at the moment. Um, a related problem, and this, is, this has been a really big problem in, in England, and I, I think throughout Europe actually, um, is the refunds problem, which we'll talk about in a moment, I know, but that has really, um, damaged consumer confidence in the travel industry as a whole, because um, certainly some of our tour operators are refunding, others are not refunding, some are providing vouchers, some are saying you have to take vouchers, some are saying you don't have to take vouchers. And there is no trust from consumers in the industry. They don't trust the industry to do the right thing if something goes wrong. So we're left with a situation where our government is telling us not to travel, our insurers are telling us that they won't cover us if we do travel and we don't have confidence that if something goes wrong while we're on holiday, we can trust our tour operator to do anything to help us. And that's a, a situation that I think is really dangerous, actually, because it means that consumers are just not going to trust the industry. They're not going to book holidays in circumstances in which they can't have any kind of confidence that anyone will help them if something goes wrong when they're abroad. And of course, it's so much worse when something goes wrong when you're abroad because you have no support mechanism. And that's why um, the package travel directives have always said that tour operators should provide support if something goes wrong in the course of a holiday. Um, 
we no longer trust the industry to comply with that and give us that support. So I think that's a very long-winded way of saying, yeah, I think it's a really big problem. Um, finding an answer is rather more difficult. Uh, I think we do need some kind of minimum assistance to be provided, um, whether that's provided by uh, some kind of minimum insurance for everyone. If you have a, if you put an insurance premium of a couple of pounds on every um, holiday and have some kind of, um, like the Atoll scheme for if, uh, if airlines go insolvent, then they'll be will be repatriated by our governments. Uh, if we were to have a, a atoll scheme plus plus, which allows for uh, a, some kind of state underwritten insurance, that um, if something were to go wrong uh, in this context, you would get medical assistance, you would get basic accommodation, um, and you would get basic information because a lot of it is about information. Uh, it's really important, particularly if you're abroad and you don't understand what's going on. It may be a different language. It's very difficult to, to get information about where you should go even. What, you know, how are you going to get medical assistance? So I think some, yeah, I think something needs to be done. Um, the big question is always going to be who's going to pay for it. Um, and whether that should be the industry in the form of tour operators or an industry body, whether it should be the government that sends the tourists, so um, it would be, in my case, it would always be the English government that would help me, or whether it should be the tourist destination. So, for example, if I go to Greece, I get supported by the Greek government. If I go to Spain, I get supported by the Spanish government in the way that the EHIC scheme works. Um, I'm quite keen to use that scheme as a, a template for this. Uh, because it's a reciprocal agreement between the countries in Europe. And I can, I can see that that works quite well. Um, because at the moment, it looks as if all the risk is falling on consumers, um, even though the European legislation, in, certainly in terms of refunds, seems to suggest that the risk should fall on the tour operator. So I think it, it is very disorganized. I think it is a major problem. And I think the answer is not clear, but we have to do something. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I think it's very interesting that you uh, spoke about the insurance, because I think that that has been the biggest surprise of many uh, tourists uh, that thought that their insurances would cover, and then they just discovered that actually their insurance uh, do not uh, provide any assistance in case of force majeure situations. And I think that has been one of the biggest discoveries of tourists as uh, consumers. and. Uh, it has definitely uh, uh, impacted uh, the crisis and how they, they've lived it. Uh, Daniel, I don't know if you agree with uh, Sarah, if uh, you think that other measures should be taken or could be taken? Well, I would probably, well, first of all, thank you very much for asking the lawyer the legal <laughs> question. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's probably helpful for me and, uh, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to join you this, uh, this afternoon. Um, if you agree, actually, what I think in order to look at, you know, which additional measures could be looked at, I thought I could share a very short presentation which looks at, you know, what's the legal landscape currently and where we can see some loopholes that actually highlight some of the concerns that Sarah just shared with us. So I, first of all, I just try to share screen. Here we go, and I hope it works. Is it visible? Okay. It so it's um, the first um, the first aspect that uh, I would uh, like to, uh, if I manage to click it, uh, let's see, because it doesn't. Uh, I cannot move it down. Why is that? Sorry, I'm trying to figure why I cannot move down the presentation. It was working before. Hmm. Let's see. Yeah. Can you still see the presentation? No. Not anymore? Not anymore. Okay. So I go back to share. Daniela, would you like us to run the presentation for you? Maybe Tiana could do that? 
Yeah, if Tiara can do that because I don't know why I have two screens for this exact purpose, but for some reason it's not working. Well, uh, well it's this is normally the grade of success because that's where Murphy's law applies completely. So, but let's Tiana. Thank God we got fantastic team in the UNWTO Academy to back us. So, do you see it now? Like, I don't see. It I guess now. this could work. Thank you, Tiana. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. So now you see it. Yes, we do, but we do it from Tiana's screen. So, Daniela, I think the best is just you tell Tiana oh. when to go for the next slide, yeah? All right, that's fine. So, it's a, this is what I presented here is fundamentally a timeline of what occurred and what the legal framework we have currently. Um, first of all, we have a European directive, um, and of course, uh, that was implemented in each European state, and it has a general principle whereby uh, when um, a customer has a right to terminate you know, a um, travel package, and uh, in, this can happen before it's uh, started, uh, the, you know, before it was in, it, it's actually using it. Um, and it's also possible in the event of so-called extraordinary, extraordinary and unavoidable situation, uh, which has, you know, that force majeure type of situations that, uh, you know, typically one may mention. It's actually, there is actually a tiny legal difference between the two. But interestingly, the European legislation says that you fundamentally can get reimbursement um, and, uh, there is not going to be a um, termination cost for um, for that, um, and that applies both to travel packages as well as hospitality contracts. What happens is that we had the COVID nineteen crisis, so the issues was you know what are the unavoidable and uh, unavoidable and extraordinary circumstances, and what is a force majeure situation? How you distinguish these two? And many legislation, uh, despite the existence of a, a European directive, which they all implemented, um, they issued what I would call special legislation. Here, what I presented is in fact a, um, you know, what it happened in Italy and we implemented you know, in two phases in uh, uh, you know, two law degrees, one um, you know, law degree number nine, number 18, both were converted in law uh, uh, in, um, in uh, thereafter. So you have emergency legislation that comes into force. And what it does, it makes a derogation to the, uh, the tourism code, which was the one that was implemented following the European directive. And what it does is, in fact, it shifts the burden, exactly what Sarah was mentioning. You know, it was the European legislation uh, provides for the uh, consumer to have the right to be reimbursed, whereas it's uh, the uh, um, it, the uh, um, special legislation, the emergency legislation, offers that right to tourism professional, which would mean, uh, for example, tour operators, and uh, and will in particular give a choice and so an option uh, to offer to the consumer either a reimbursement or a voucher. Uh, and by the way, this is happening also in the events that um, those are offered and paid through a digital platform. Because let's not forget that we are in a world where a lot of the tourism uh, activity is in fact managed virtually through virtual platforms, both for uh, bookings as well as selections and marketing. Um, then we have later on in May a European recommendation that, as you, Alicia, mentioned, you know, it's it uh, does not have a binding effect on on member states, but it has a guidance, and it indicated three interesting uh, criteria because what it said is that the vouchers should be valid for at least twelve months. So we have a duration term for your right of enjoyment of what was your original travel plan or travel contract. Those have to be transferable and they have to be replaceable. 
And it also indicates that uh, they should enjoy protection in the event of insolvency. You know, but what does that mean? Is it a secured credit or it's not? So the recommendation in fact goes as far as Sarah was saying to basically create a sort of um, a system that uh, would offer confidence, if you wish, to the uh, consumer to um, have that voucher replaced or transferred or secured in the case of, of, of uh, um, uh, bankruptcy. And why it would be that, that would have been a very interesting measure if it were to be implemented at national level or internationally, because it would really bring back confidence. You have a voucher which you can use and transfer you know, from country to country and uh, you know, within the European Union for sure, uh, to be seen if that could be a method uh, to um, enjoy travel for the next 18 months. Because one of the major concerns is that 18 months is a long enough time for many tour operator or other tourism professionals to in fact go bankrupt, in particular if the uh, um, crisis were to be repeated again after fall, as some are uh, foreseeing. Uh, if we go to the other slide, which uh, I don't know, at this point I cannot control, <laughs> um, you know, you'll see that, uh, you know, what happened is that Italy for sure, but this is actually true in a number of other uh, member states, um, this derogation to the uh, consumer, well, now I see the... <laughs> The, the slide myself. Yeah, um, no, it's the number two, please. Slide number two. Oh. Yes. Uh, so what happens is that the, uh, you know, the, the Italian law, basically, the special Italian law has basically derogated, so made an exception to what the European directive says. To the point that having, having reversed the European principle, we have a communication of the 28th of uh, May, which issued by the Italian Antitrust Authority, which indicates that that measure is in clear conflict with the European legal framework. And the, in particular, um, the other aspect that uh, I think it's important to uh, raise for you know, our common reflection is that uh, this principle applies to all Italian accommodation facilities, regardless of the customer nationality, but also regardless of the digital platform. So if you have been using, if you have a contract that has been um, in force were to be was entered between the 12th of March up to the 30th of uh, September, but was not performed during this time period. You know, you can have you can be reimbursed with a voucher which has 12 months validity, and, uh, and, and this is the one that can offer the voucher in lieu. So instead of reimbursement, in fact, are those tour operators and hotel operators, even in the event the client prefers the reimbursement, because that's what the special law provides for. So if you go to the next slide, what this has created is that, um, you know, we have a situation right now where we could start from a level playing field through the European legislation, but in fact, in the moment of crisis, there has been a, a, an exception made and a derogation so that uh, we have a very um, different uh, and unbalanced situation. If I look at tourism as a you know, global market, um, and uh, for example, you know, if you look at digital platforms, you know, they may not necessarily have agreement with the consumers according to Italian law. Italian tour operators and professionals, on the other hand, have an interest of, uh, of in, in keeping their liquidity and therefore they will be definitely more interested in offering customers and therefore consumers a voucher instead of a reimbursement. But the choice should be to the consumer and not to the uh, tourism professional. Uh, not only, but this consumer credit is unsecured at this, at this stage. Um, so, um, while it is recommended to be transferable and replaceable, 
Um, that is yet not the case because we do not have an international standard or an international agreement that would qualify how it, a voucher can be transferable, replaceable and secured. And plus, let's remember that those are basic elements, basic uh, criteria that generally are um, helpful for the entire uh, tourism value chain to ensure a recurring business because you have a certain degree of confidence which is established. So if you go to the next and last uh, slide, um, uh, it's, uh, um, we could say that European urbanization in fact suffered during the uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis and uh, the possibility of having international standards would help to compete and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a global market with uh, you know, offering safe travel, um, but also um, uh, while looking at it, it's important that we keep in mind, I think is a very important uh, piece of legislation which is upcoming and is actually impacting on our discussions, which is the new Digital Service Act package, uh, which in fact is of interest for for this industry because of you know, how the uh, digital, uh, they call it digital revolution or disruption is now impacting on that industrial segment. Um, and we all know that, you know, whoever is operating in this industry knows that uh, platforms become more and more important. And so customer protection, uh, consumers protection has to take into account all of that legislation which looks at how those rights are granted at the moment uh, during the uh, in a uh, uh, e-contract uh, situation. So voila, that are you know the uh, you asked me whether I found elements similar to the one that Sarah mentioned and I would say absolutely I think Sarah pointed to the fact that uh, to date, we have no state guaranteed vouchers. Those are unsecured. Can, at the moment, they do not have necessarily the characteristic of being transferable. Um, and uh, it's certainly missing uh, uh, also a uh, uh, general uh, application of the European principle, at least that is the case of Italy currently, whereby the tourism code, which uh, initially provided for the consumer to have a right to reimbursement, has been superseded by the, uh, except by the special legislation post-COVID-19. So to be seen what is going to happen in the next, uh, during the next months. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> We moved already into the in in the vouchers, uh, but definitely I think that you uh, concluded with uh, Sarah on some of the measures that should be uh, taking. Although the real question is who pays for what, and uh, also you were mentioning that um, I mean in many European countries because Europe, uh, the Department of Europe is not only EU; is also other European countries in many European countries, and especially also in the U EU directives. The responsibility to assist tourists in emergency situations falls on the organ organizer or the carrier um, in view of the directives. But it's true also that these directives uh, perhaps didn't contemplate an emergency such as the COVID-19 uh, that, you know, uh, we're not talking about days of an emergency, but uh, some people have been confined for months uh, yeah. in, in and stranded in another country. So, um, I'm, I'm asking Michael, now I'm turning to you. Um, do you do you think, I mean, the EC has issued recommendations and interpretative guidance and Daniela mentioned it too, um, but these are not binding as you uh, very rightfully said. So um, do you think that this crisis has revealed some uh, loopholes in the European legislation uh, in terms of assisting tourists during emergency situations? that this EU legislation was not ready and that it would be about time to fill it in with some um, standards and not only recommendations. Yes, uh, I think that's definitely the case. And uh, 
<clears throat> before getting to the issue of vouchers and refunds, uh, I want to touch some more general issues. Uh, and uh, I want to pick up on what Sarah said about insurance. Uh, our late emeritus president of IFTA, Jose Fosman from Israel, years over years in our conferences, uh, he was advocating the idea of two pillars in worldwide tourism, one being a global system of rules and the other one being a global insurance system. And I have to admit that I have been skeptical about the idea of a global insurance which was meant to pay for everything that could happen uh, during travel and uh, tourism activities uh, because then the question of course arises who would pay for the premiums and if that was really a global uh, unified insurance system this would be a very powerful organization so who would be in control of that system that's the other uh, concern that i had uh, so what we saw in the corona crisis and what i think is uh, of a very big concern for uh, consumers and travelers uh, is what happens to me if I strand in another country? Who will take care of me? How can I get accommodation? How can I get access to the health system? How can I get repatriated? We saw that even within the Schengen area in Europe, uh, the different member states decided to just close their borders without any coordination uh, with the EU Commission or within each other. So this was only based on national decisions and uh, there was no European coordination of all these measures. And we also saw cruise ships uh, where we had uh, infected passengers and these cruise ships were denied access to harbors and had to sail on open sea for days and days and looking for a harbor where people could go on land. So I think uh, we need rules and these rules of course should be global rules uh, on state measures to be taken in regard to border management, in regard to access to health systems for tourists uh, in regard to access to harbors for cruise ships in emergency situations or pandemic situations, as we saw, and in regard to the provision of accommodation to stranded tourists. Because uh, if we look at the uh, package travel directive of uh, 2015, the new directive, it has a provision on assistance to travelers in emergency or in difficulty and the obligation is on the organizer uh, but if we look uh, on the examples given in uh, article 16 of the directive it looks that these obligations are rather information obligation because it mentions information on health system information on consular services and so on. So it's not the obligation to provide services. It's mainly an obligation to provide information and assistance. So we need someone else. We need an, another institution to provide the related services. And I think this can only be an obligation of the host states uh, to uh, provide all these uh, measures and services. Uh, another uh, open issue for me is an unsolved issue is the question uh, of the repatriation. Uh, the package travel directive provides that uh, if the return of the traveler cannot be ensured, then the organizer uh, has to pay for three nights of accommodation. Uh, I think the focus of this uh, provision was a cancellation of uh, carriers, a cancellation of transportation services. 
and not, uh, for instance, uh, quarantine, quarantine measures imposed on the traveler himself or a hospitalization of the traveler. I think the provision does not cover these cases. So who has to provide accommodation in case of a quarantine imposed by the host state or in case of a hospitalization of the uh, traveler? And again, uh, the only institution I can imagine to uh, be burdened with these obligations are the host states, are the receiving states. And perhaps with some kind of assistance and cooperation with the sending states, with the, uh, the states of origin of the travelers. Yeah, so this is basically my, uh, my general remarks. Uh, I don't know whether you want me to go into the issue of vouchers yet or whether I should wait with that issue. Yes, before I, I just wanted to uh, to say that actually you said exactly uh, what was, uh, let's say, contemplated in Annex 1 of the draft framework uh, convention uh, that UNWTO uh, was working on uh, in terms of, uh, of putting the responsibility on the receiving states because they mm -hmm. are, at the end of the day, the ones that are better placed in order to provide accommodation uh, to provide also access to the health services in the same conditions as nationals. Um, so even if we were, were to, uh, you know, imagine that the sending state should take these responsibilities, uh, it would not be realistic, it would not be feasible. Uh, so this responsibility needs to be uh, taken by the, the, the receiving states. So this was exactly, I think, the consensus that we have reached um, in the um, draft uh, framework convention. Of course, the emergencies that we were contemplating at the time when this were, was being drafted were not of the magnitude of, uh, of this crisis, um, but I think they, they, uh, they probably remain uh, quite valid. Uh, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's the host state that needs to restore confidence on their uh, health system, on their securities, on their protocols, and also on the assistance that they would provide to tourists that come to visit. So it should be sort of a, of a package. So yes, thank you very much for, um, for uh, reflecting so well the consensus that had been uh, achieved and in which IFTA was also a great contributor to the framework convention. And uh, now turning to the, to the vouchers issue, um, and also with uh, Daniela explained very well the situation uh, in Italy, uh, which we have seen in, in different countries in Europe in very different ways. So now we have all sorts of vouchers uh, because there are also different categories of vouchers. Uh, we have countries that only allow the vouchers for tour operators. We have all other countries that allow the vouchers for tour operators, for carriers, for even within the EU again. And uh, in, in this context, also the EU has, um, uh, has reaffirmed its strong commitment with consumer protection rights um, and through its recommendations, through its uh, interpretative guidance. So I, I want to ask you, Michael, I, I, will, uh, I will start with you on this issue. Um, if, uh, how do you see also the way forward? What are the legal implications, both for the industry, but also for the tourists? Um, taking into account that vouchers have already been provided and also what happens, you know, if uh, tour operators now or carriers become insolvent because they are unable to, um, to do all the refunds. So how do you see the situation evolving and what are your views on this? Uh, yes, I think that uh, mandatory vouchers so which means that vouchers where the choice to provide vouchers is on the organizer or the carrier and not on the traveler uh, are certainly not in line with uh, european legislation in particular the package travel directive and the uh, passenger rights uh, regulations which all uh, explicitly provide for a refund to the passengers or travelers. 
Um, I don't think that national legislation really can overrule uh, these European uh, pieces of legislation because of the uh, primacy of European law over national law. And um, that could become a problem for uh, member states who still choose to do so. On the other hand, it's quite understandable that such measures uh, were taken by some member states uh, because uh, travel industry was really uh, confronted with a big problem. On the one hand, uh, organizers, for instance, uh, had already made payments to their service partners, to the service providers, and they didn't receive any refunds from them because the hotelier said, I don't refund you because my hotel still open, uh, you can send guests to me. But of course the organizer couldn't because all the flights were canceled, for instance. Uh, and uh, being uh, confronted with this problem on the one hand, on the other hand, the organizer had the obligation to refund uh, the travelers within 14 days. And that of course caused big, big uh, troubles uh, on the financial side. And uh, I see some other problem coming up with this issue uh, because uh, we have insolvency protection in the package travel directive, but uh, the article says that there is protection for the payments made by the traveler if the services are not performed as a consequence of the insolvency of the organizer. And I'm quite sure that we will see cases where the insurer will say, oh, that doesn't apply to the COVID-19 situation because the reason for the cancellation of the trip by the organizer was not the insolvency, it was the COVID-19 crisis and the insolvency only was a consequence of the cancellation of all the trips. So it was the other way around, not the non-performance of the service services as a consequence of the insolvency, but the insolvency as a consequence of the non-performance of the services and the refunds to be made. And I'm curious on uh, what the decisions of the European Court of Justice in these cases will be. And I'm quite certain that we will see these cases. And that's a big problem and a big issue with the vouchers as well, uh, because vouchers only have any value for the travelers or the tourists if they are insolvency protected. And according to the current system of the directive, there is no such insolvency protection for vouchers. So can a national legislation uh, cover these vouchers under the insolvency protection system and put an additional burden on the insurers? I don't know. That's question of constitutional law and also question of uh, European law, of course. But as long as we don't have uh, insolvency protection for vouchers, I don't think that vouchers can be a solution, uh, in particular, if we want to uh, re-establish trust of the travelers and the consumers in tourism. Definitely. Oh, well, here in Spain, uh, the vouchers uh, need to be uh, need to be issued with uh, uh, bank warranty. I mean, with some guarantee and uh, from the state. So, uh, but I I I wonder also, Sarah, because you mentioned about the vouchers, but actually the United Kingdom was is one of the countries that has not derogated yet from the directive, if I'm correct. That's right. So, yeah. and, and still you mentioned that the, that vouchers have also been issued and with uh, also perhaps in, with different, uh, in, in different categories because they are vouchers and vouchers. Some yeah. are reimbursable, yeah. uh, some are not. Uh, so if you can give us also a little bit of the of, of what has been happening in uh, in the United Kingdom, I think it's very uh, useful for for us. Even though uh, the UK is not one of our member states, but as a EU uh, EU country, I think it's very interesting to know uh, what has been the experience there. Yeah, I and mean, it's actually quite it's it, it's um, 
quite weird for us because we're Brexiting at the moment. So we're transitioning out of the European Union. Um, but we are one of the few states that seems to be taking the directive seriously. So it seems to us that we're taking the European directives more seriously than some of the countries that are staying in Europe, which is quite a, an odd situation for us to be in. Um, because if we had Brexited before all of this, of course, we could do whatever we want with the voucher scheme. It wouldn't matter. Um, but we, uh, I mean, the UK government's position is we cannot derogate from uh, our regulations that we brought into play as a result of the directive um, because we can't do it lawfully because of our obligations uh, under the European treaties. And it seems to me that Michael's absolutely right about that. That must be right. Um, any country, I think, that is legislating to allow vouchers instead of refunds um, is playing a very dangerous game because they're not complying with their obligations uh, at, at a European level. Um, and, the, you know, we, we are, the UK is. Um, but as a result of that, what's happening in the UK is that um, as a matter of law, consumers are entitled to refunds, um, but our tour operators and airlines are not giving them refunds. So our tour operators and airlines, uh, 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 quite a large number of them are not complying with um, their consumer obligations. And our government doesn't seem to have a will to do anything about that. So whilst on the one hand, we haven't derogated, uh, so as a matter of law, they're entitled to consumers are entitled to refunds, they're not actually getting them. And there don't seem to be any consequences at the moment to tour operators and airlines um, for, for not providing refunds. So what's happening at the moment is that tourists are, and, and consumers are locked in a battle with the industry, um, which is the longer it goes on, the worse it gets because it erodes consumer confidence in the industry because people have been fighting their tour operators to get uh, refunds for months now. And these are people, some of whom have lost their jobs, some of them have been furloughed. You know, it, it's, um, we have to bear in mind that actually nobody has any money at the moment. The tour operators don't have any money for the reasons that Michael rightly gives. Um, but also the consumers don't have any money and they're not going to book another holiday if they don't have any money and they haven't been provided with the refund for the first holiday that they weren't able to take. So that this, this whole refund issue for me is the crucial point on trying to restore confidence in the industry um, because people are, are they're very angry with the industry. They're angry with the, the travel industry. They're angry with the insurance industry. They're angry with the government for not doing enough to help them. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, in the UK, it's a real mess because we've done nothing. So it's a bit of a free for all. Um, the, the answer to that, I think, is that um, if we don't derogate, and I don't see how we can legally derogate from the terms of the directive, um, the UK government needs to um, force the airlines and the tour operators to provide refunds, even if it then provides the, the money for them to do that because of the cash flow problems, as Michael says. So I think that is the only solution that I can see, but it, it doesn't seem to be happening at the moment. Thank you. I think uh, for Alessandra and for me, it's very, very refreshing to um, listen to the perspective of the tourists because we, you know, so much has been going on in terms of developing health protocols, developing security protocols, harmonizing all of that to, to bring security to the tourists. And so little has been said about these matters with, at the end of the day, matter a lot to the tourists because it's about their pockets and it's about their holidays and the money that they gave for, I don't know, Easter holidays um, that has not been refunded to them yet, while at the same time, we're asking them already to book another uh another holiday so um yeah i mean i think for a lot of people they're buying a holiday is a really big deal it's a you know if you've got a couple of children buying a holiday it might be the most expensive thing you buy that year so it's this is not just a theoretical discussion this is something you know people are very angry not to get that money back and they they can't afford to book another holiday if they don't get that money back because people save up all year to, to spend money on a holiday. 
Um, so I think they, the consumer, consumer confidence has to be central to this discussion. Um, and, and this is not helping. No, definitely. And also talking about harmonizing uh, this consumer rights protection, even within the EU, even with the directives in place that are not necessarily being, uh, you know, enforced, um, how do we move forward? Because to me, this is not only an EU problem, but also, um, you know, it affects, uh, it's, it's worldwide, it's a worldwide problem. Uh, also, because it seems that uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, the EU uh, tour operators, carriers are being placed under more stringent uh, conditions because of the directives, even if then, you know, they might not be uh, fully complying with them, but they are being placed in a more difficult position um, uh, in comparison with tour operators and carriers of uh, outside EU. So perhaps Daniela, with your insight too of the, you know, EC uh, travel package directive, uh, do, do you think it is possible to harmonize the EU uh, standards that we have with the rest uh, of the world, would that benefit also uh, EU citizens, but also EU uh, tour operators and carriers? And how do you, do, do you think this is uh, feasible? This is something feasible, because this is actually one of the essential points where we were always having an argument when we were working in the draft convention, um, there was always an argument as two of the annexes to this convention were very much inspired in EU legislation, uh, which we were trying to harmonize with the rest of the world. Um, and so now, you know, with this COVID-19, this discussion is more, even more relevant if we uh, want to ensure some uh, equal competition and also, uh, you know, that tourists uh, don't need to look into the legislation of the countries to see what, uh, you know, what can I expect if I uh, travel outside of the EU. So what, what is your standpoint on this? What are your ideas? Well, uh, maybe it's a perspective, it's a bit legalistic, but uh, if you think about sale of goods, no, there are international treaties on the sale of goods and uh, contractually you can decide to follow them or not. Uh, but if you do go with those treaties, you know what the rules are, you know, and who bears the risks and, uh, you know, what, if something happens in transit, whose responsibility it is, who has to pay for what. Um, so I would say that um, given that tourism is a global industry, um, if we were to find... Uh, you know, certain international principles that everyone could agree upon that would probably benefit transparency in the various uh, um, contractual relationship that you have when you organize um, a, a trip. Now, if you look at very basically, you know, from a consumer perspective, you know, you have a contract with a carrier, you have a contract with the tour operator, you have a booking tour platform, then you have some extra services that you get from uh, in the, in the hosting country, you have transportation. This is a bulk of uh, uh, information and uh, potential exposure uh, that, you know, if you were to uh, just once for all agree on one criteria, you know, you would know exactly where you stand, uh, you know, kind of a one-stop shop if you want. Um, I understand that that's a hard to be achieved, uh, but one could find at least a minimum common ground uh, on which an agreement could be found. Um, and I think it could be also a um, competition lever if you want, you know, if you were to be within those uh, rules you know, because consumers would know that they have that degree of guarantee, at least on certain points. Um, there are areas in which I am a little bit more, um, uh, let's say, pessimistic that one could find <clears throat> easily an agreement. Uh, one of which is, for example, insurance. Uh, that is because an act of God is not going to be insured, you know, just economically not viable. <clears throat> so if you have a uh, volcano uh, eruption or if you have a pandemic emergency, uh, it's hard that that would be covered in your, um, you know, in your insurance, in your travel insurance. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, especially now that we had a, a pandemic crisis, uh, I do agree that there could be um, domestic uh, funds. So the host country having, uh, um, uh, let's say, insurance fund, but has a, an emergency fund that could be used. I make you an example. Um, one could be, uh, um, let's think about earthquakes, right? <laughs> you know, there are certain situations where there are similar uh, emergencies and, uh, and uh, funds have to be found. And instead of having a, an emergency law, like the one that many European states have enacted, they actually have a fund, an emergency fund through which they can cope with similar situation and guarantee consumers and travelers that they will still have that liquidity and that that uh, you know cash at hand for building a house or returning home or being repatriated or whatever that would apply to. Um, on the other hand, um, you know it's a uh, um, um, currently it's a struggle. You know to respond to what Sarah was saying, uh, it's a struggle because everyone is fighting for who gets the gets the cash. <laughs> And so, you know, it's, you have to find and strike a balance. And I think, you know, if we want to look at it in good faith, and I would say that this alternative of voucher versus reimbursement, you know, if you look at it with a grain of salt, you see there might be situations where, you know, someone may not be in a, in a, in a, in a, not have the standing, the possibility to actually use the voucher in the, you know, next 18 months and that I think there should be a right to refund in other situations that could be viable and uh, and if viable then you know possibly a voucher could be an okay solution um, the uh, striking the balance between the two I'm afraid it's it could be complicated and I'm afraid that it could actually lead to litigation especially in countries that do have class actions I expect that it might happen uh, that the association may get together and uh, you know this happens actually this is possible in Italy as well uh, that you, know, you, you could have a class uh, to uh, um, you know claim your rights if those as you know are homogeneous and and uh, and I fear that we might might see that in the next few months. So better having an international standards that you know, leaving to a class action, the um, let's say the finding striking that balance, uh, you know, afterwards instead of in a preventive situation. I hope this answers your questions. <laughs> I think I, I, uh, I said, I didn't say this at the beginning, but of course, we're not expecting you to have all the answers because no one has them. Uh, but I think this is really good for us, uh, in, even for our internal discussions at UNWTO uh, that we're having on the, on the matter and looking at what we had done in the past and now trying to integrate also, um, you know, uh, fitting it to emergencies such as the one of the COVID-19. Uh, which has a completely, you know, has turned the world upside down, our world upside down. But it does give uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, ideas, especially I, th I, uh, I think very little was said in the draft convention on insurance. And uh, this is definitely, uh, this is also definitely, I mean, I think that many of these standards are also going to come because the, the tourist is going to demand them. So, and I think that uh, for tourists, it's very difficult to understand, no matter how hard we try, that insurance is that the travel insurance would not cover for any of these situations. So, I think this is definitely something to be uh, looking at. Alicia, can I take the floor back? Yes. Well, First of all, I hate to uh, the sort of uh, insert myself into this discussion. I, of course, like to listen to these webinars as if I'm a viewer. And mostly, I definitely like to have the perspective of the consumer, of the person that is traveling, of the person that wants to book a holiday. But as many of you have basically said, 
doesn't know if it's safe to do so, how to do it, how much uh, would I need to, the first thing I would ask now, of course, is what is the cancellation policy, something that maybe I wouldn't have thought about it before, because before the decision-making process, which has been widely analyzed by psychologists, when you're, when you're traveling, is normally a decision-making which takes place a little bit ahead of time. Of course, there's last minute, we all know that, but it involves an, 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 a wide, uh, let's say, a perspective of emotions and of elements that it's rarely seen as something that you would have to give up all of a sudden. And when you give it up, then there's a lot of shock. Um, and I'm just talking about the good side, not even taking into, into the account all the turmoil that the fact of being stranded in, a, in an uncomfortable and unsafe situation has brought. Now, as promised, we've all taken notes of all the questions that have been uh, piling up. We have very attentive audience, which is the thing that, you know, makes me the happiest when you have a lot of people asking a lot of questions, some of them even slightly philosophical, which is what we like about our audience. And so I'm gonna put them forward, but guess what? There are exactly four questions. So I'm gonna to try to address each and every one of you on this, but of course, everybody else feel free. Now, of course, uh, Sarah has specifically asked for a, no, I'm not gonna do that. But no, seriously, the, one of the questions that has been, been repeated is how do you actually restore consumer confidence? Like a lot of people are asking, saying, okay, this is good to know, but how do you actually, you know, bring the consumer back? So I don't know, maybe Michael, you would want to help us in, uh, in uh, I know that this is one of those, you know, uh, crystal ball questions, you know, or million dollars questions. Nevertheless, you know, maybe you have that answer that will get you the million dollar. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid I don't have the answer for, for that million dollar question. Uh, but uh, yes, some of the ideas which, which I have always, already expressed earlier, uh, I think it would be a, at least a contribution uh, to re-establishing consumer confidence if they know what they can expect uh, in the countries they go to, if they are sure, if they have assurance that they have access to health system if they need it, and if they can be sure that they will provide it with accommodation if they need it. And so these basic needs, I think, if we can uh, establish uh, confidence that these basic needs will always be satisfied, uh, that could be at least uh, a first and important step uh, for confidence in tourism as a whole. Well, thank you for that. Many countries, I mean, us at UNWTO, as, as you might know, we are uh, from the beginning of the, this pandemic, we are basically on the front line. Uh, we, uh, some of my Italian friends have been uh, let's say do, using the paraphrasis that we are like the blue helmets of tourism in this moment. And I think we somehow really are because we've been, the most thing that we've been trying to do is we gather all the information from the member states. And we try to understand not only, for example, through our fantastic colleagues of, that elaborate data, what are the trends and what are the forecasts and you know, trying to restoring confidence with numbers it's really complex in a way, but you know, numbers are what they are. So we are very much in favor of saying rather than not saying or you know, adjusting numbers. Because when, you, when you're dealing with numbers, when you're dealing with companies, SMEs, when you're dealing with people, you cannot pretend that things are different from what they really are. But one other thing where we collect member states' inputs is, uh, for example, on all their measures. And we're observing that member states now that this is a pandemic, so it's globally uh, uh, considered, have developed different levels of answers. And some of them, uh, actually, Michael, have invested a lot in doing that type of thing, in establishing like safety protocols and communicating them to probably contribute a bit more to restoring the consumer confidence, even though the ones that didn't do it is not because they were not clever enough, it's because we don't really know what we're dealing with health-wise. So we don't, you, don't, you, you never know to where you need to push your boundary in terms of telling 
the potential consumer, the tourist, the international tourist, even the domestic tourist, you know, please come to us, we're okay. Because all of this struck us by surprise. No one knew it was coming. No one knew it was gonna hit Europe. I think there was some type of, you know, unvulnerability. We all thought we're Highlanders, uh, but reality is that Europe got hit very badly, especially, I would say the landmarks of tourism, which is Italy and Spain. So that is a lesson learned. Nevertheless, interestingly enough, uh, one of the other questions that have been arising up and Daniela touched upon that, so I would like to uh, uh, basically start uh, returning to you the question, Daniela. One of the questions was exactly on online platforms because we are somehow, we, it feels like you, we have something in mind which really belongs to the traditional model of uh, um, a vacation in a way, and may, basically to the traditional stakeholders, which include, of course, the transport and the official, I would say, accommodation. So the question is, how do we actually deal with the online platforms that promote a different type of stay because you're going to someone else's house, whether you're having the house by yourself or you're sharing the room, first of all, do you really, do you think that this will be possible again? And if it will be possible, what is the major uh, impact on consumer rights into that perspective? Well, this is a very interesting and difficult question because when we talk about uh, platforms, in fact, there are very different type of platforms. You now you have some that, you know, just deal with the bookings, um, some others where you actually I don't want to make advertisement to platforms, but let's say some help you through uh, choosing the best flights. Uh, some help you searching the best price hotels, hotels and flights. Um, others, uh, in fact, have a completely different nature and uh, look at other type of hospitality, uh, which I would describe as a uh, incumbent to the traditional hospitality business. So first issue there is uh, how you ensure the same standards, you know, from one to another, you know, because we when you discuss about uh, tour operator and hospitality contract, we are discussing generally uh, traditional hospitality. But then there is also the upcoming hospitality, condo hotel, you know, Airbnb, let's say it. <laughs> and uh, all of that is actually new and it's looked at from different perspective, traditionally from a tax perspective, but now it has to be looked at also from a consumer perspective very attentively. Um, and uh, as a lot of the digital, the new digital services, it's highly, um, there is a, I mean, it relies highly on the feedback that you get from other customers. Um, but in fact, you do not have a strong level of uh, um, comfort offered by some of those platforms. Also with different type of relationship that are established from a contractual standpoint. Um, I don't wanna get into the details of how, you know, how those platform create the margin, but generally what they do, they operate as a, what is called the virtual marketplace. So that they withheld a margin over the transaction, but the ultimate relationship remains with the, um, you know, uh, with the um, host and the uh, consumer. Uh, if we look at it, looking forward, I think it will be um, quite uh, um, important, I think, to monitor uh, what is going to happen, as I mentioned, to the new Digital Services Act, uh, because uh, uh, the liability of platforms and looking at those type of, uh, um, and by the way, there is a consultation going on, I think, right now up until this, the 8th of uh, September, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think that uh, package should also uh, look into uh, our specific industry and, uh, uh, and establish a certain degree of liability for marketplaces that operate in the industry vis-a-vis -vis, uh, 
the what I would say the um, uh, the counterpart to the margin they make. Because if we think about it, you know, they withhold a part of the value of the transaction, but in fact, for what? You know, th there has to be a counterpart there. Uh, okay, when we say technology, fine, but after a certain number of years, you have amortized that investment. And it gets to a point where you should, you know, also provide a certain level of guarantee and, and uh, you know, which we could spell out in different ways, but a certain service and protection in terms of quality, you know, safety, et cetera, should be, uh, I think it should be granted. Uh, otherwise, again, we do not have, I think, in fairness, a, a correct competition between traditional hospitality and, and upcoming hospitality. You know, when you have similar methods, that would be great. Well, John, Daniel, I'm going to join into this to bring it, as I said before, I'm going to play the, you know, the um, Mr. Smith uh, sort of role. Actually, in countries, especially like ours, Italy, let's be fairly honest, what the platforms brought is a very high level of illegality because as well, and this is where it takes me now to the next question uh, that I would like to address to Sarah, data. Okay, when we talk about what emerged in this pandemic, let's be fairly honest and let's be try to be a little simple, is that some countries in the world that have probably greater facility as well in, in let's say managing the privacy of data were able to control the pandemic because they were able to monitor their citizens and therefore uh, the citizens were, were happy to give up a little bit of their privacy to allow the government to allow the let's say the safety uh, I would say the sanitary uh, uh, institutions to take care of them in a, in a way. The problem that we have with online uh, platforms with alternative ways of hospitality especially is that somehow you lose track and somehow uh, those big platforms which you were very correctly mentioned all these questions are definitely going to be addressed uh, are not willing to disclose these type of data and if we want to also allow let's say insurance companies to come forward and to find a solution there, we also need to agree. I firmly believe this, and I would like to hear it from Sarah as well with a very, another very specific question that we need to understand that if we want to achieve something, we also have to give up something, meaning that we cannot think, and this is also another question that we're just gonna go back to normal in the sense that we're gonna go back to, okay, we were locked down for a while. We're all wearing masks. We should be afraid and let's wait for the vaccine so we can all go back to party. No, this has to serve as an occasion because certain things have demonstrated that they can get out of hand because the pandemic, most people say that is the result of uncontrolled flows. So in a way, we need those data in order to, to monitor as much as possible. I'm a firm believer and I, I, I've never taken sides in webinars. I have to be honest with you, I need to take sides in this because we have to be ready to set some rules and Alicia, I think, knows this very well, you know, when you're going towards establishing standards or establishing big, large documents, you also have to be ready to support governments in rulemaking. Now, Sarah, I wanted to challenge you on something which came across from the questions as well. Is the vouchers versus money to the consumer very, you know, simple aspect? 16 countries, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Daniela and Alicia, please, please help me in this from the European Union were, let's say, stigmatized by the European Commission to say, naughty, you shouldn't have given uh, the district of voucher, you should have given the alternative. Now, I, if I am a government now, I have a problem because let's say that this happens. The governments have thought, let's try to support the companies as well, all right? So they have done it probably in the best of intentions, not to harm consumers, but to say, okay, guys, we're not saying you're not gonna get your money back. We're just saying, please hold on. They're gonna give you a voucher. Let's not punish and penalize the uh, hotel industry or the organized travel industry because they're gonna have to reimburse you, AKA give you money and they don't have the liquidity. So it was part of a complex, let's say 
thinking definitely for the good of it. Sarah, pragmatically, what do you think about this? I mean, let, let for, forget for a minute that there was a European Commission reprimanda to these countries. What do you think is definitely a good practice forward? Um, it's interesting that you ask the English lawyer that because um, we are very, um, very much bound by precedent. It's one of the things that is very interesting about this pandemic for lawyers is that you're right, different countries have different attitudes to what rights they're prepared to give up. And we've seen countries giving up freedom of movement, uh, right to privacy, right to education, um, some freedom of speech. And some countries are much more comfortable with that than others. Um, speaking as an English lawyer, we have a very strong feeling that if the law says something, then until the law is changed, you have to go with what it says. And you can't change the law res retrospectively. We have very, very few laws that, that change things retrospectively and go back and affect things that happened before the law comes in. So it's really interesting for me to see the Italian law because that changed things retrospectively. It came in in May, but it changed things for people who had holidays in March. Now in England, I'm not saying that could never happen, but that as an English lawyer, that is that makes me very, very uncomfortable. Um, I can't see the, uh, the British government doing that. So as far as, as, an, as an English lawyer, um, it is very clear that the law says that consumers are entitled to refunds. I absolutely accept everything you say about why it was done and the liquidity and keeping things going. Um, but once you start messing around with laws and making them apply to things that happened before you pass that law, I mean, that's just the beginning of the end. You know, for an English lawyer, that is um, impossible to understand. So for, <laughs> for me, I find that really, really challenging. You know, right now I'm the director of the Region Europe, as Alicia mentioned before, we're 42 countries out of which Italy is one, but I would be very interested to have you saying the same in a, in a we, we might, Daniela, we might bring Sarah over to Italy uh, sometime, you know, to a, a larger webinar. So Sarah, you just called in for challenge. And as, 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 a, as a British lawyer, you have to go by the challenge. Now, my dearest colleague, Alicia, this is a very interesting question and seemed to be, I swear I didn't pay anyone, it just came across naturally. So the question is the following, how confident are you that countries would agree on having a global system and you know international standards that they would refer to? So based on uh, past experience, uh, when we were drafting, you know, the framework convention, uh, we had, of course, a lot of reluctance from many of our member states, uh, even on the fact that UNWTO had a role in creating uh, or developing international standards. And uh, some member states even challenged whether, you know, under our statutes, we could uh, develop these international standards. Um, I think we, we set up uh, first, you know, with uh, the adoption of the uh, Framework Convention on Tourism Ethics. That was a, a significant milestone for the organization and also for the member states in, in seeing that, you know, uh, consensus can be reached and uh, we can uh, develop international standards that are useful for them. So my confidence is placed very much on uh, developing something that is useful for the states, that they see as something that would really make a difference and um, would really help, would, will really help them in restoring tourism confidence. I think if we develop something that is, and perhaps we have, we, we're gonna have to think outside of the box in developing this. Um, because you know the the former rules might not apply anymore and i think we're going to have to think it through very much but i my confidence is based on on uh, developing something that is really useful and that they see an interest in it and that they take ownership on it so i am hopeful yeah indeed uh 
you have to be hopeful because we've engaged uh, uh, in, a, in, I think, a very interesting path. And it's good to see how things come back again, right, Alicia? There was a point when this convention was somehow put aside and now it's becoming more urgent than ever. I would just I like to uh, quote one very, very last question from a friend, uh, Jan Cordet, and exactly, you know, pinpointing, going back a little bit to the voucher system, he says, how can we assure that vouchers are a benefit for the consumer, but also for the local supplier and not only for the intermediate. Now, you see, I mean, vouchers, reimbursement, this is a very complex matter. And I believe that there is no right answer. Probably the right answer would be to give international principles and let country follow it and then definitely adapt it according as well to the level of development of their own industry. Because in some of the countries of UNWTO, Alicia, correct me if I'm wrong, you definitely know more than me, but the level of complexity is not as developed as it is in Europe. So definitely it is something that we need to look after in, uh, in much details. So Alicia, I would re be really honored if you could uh, uh, round up this uh, amazing webinar, even though it's one of these webinars, uh, if Diana allows us, that I would like to keep on going for another hour, but let's stick to the timing. So why don't you, Alicia, challenge our fantastic panelists for, for last, Round. Yes, so, uh, well, first, I think that we have now as an organization, you know, a second chance uh, to think about this and to and to develop some standards. We did a lot of work. There are six years of work. Uh, there are archives, there are discussions that went through. Uh, many member states were engaged. The European Commission was engaged. Uh, so, you know, I think that now everyone should be aware that these situations um, may not just happen, you know, once every 10 years, that they are there and that we need to be prepared. And uh, I, I hope that we will continue the discussions uh, with, uh, with you three because uh, definitely, you know, we need uh, your expertise in, in, in developing this and your ideas. And as I said before, I think that we need new ideas. Michael, you mentioned the global insurance, insurance funds. I mean, all of these ideas, we, re we really need to um, look at them very closely. Now, my last question um, to all of you would, you, would be um, how, um, how do you see the future? How do you see the future of consumer rights protection? For me, it's very clear that this is just going to be a demand from the consumer so that um, states are going to have to, you know, to reflect on this and to make sure that expectations are clear, uh, that there is a fair um, and, and balanced share of the responsibilities. I think this is just going to come, you know, because there's no way around it. There's no other way around it if we want to restore tourist confidence. But I, I'd, li I'd like very much to hear uh, your views on this. May I start with uh, Sarah? Yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, Sarah, I did you realize you've just been hired? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's so, that's such a hard question. Um, none of us foresaw any of this. You know, we're just making it up as we go along. We all are. Um, I, I think more standardization. Uh, I, I hope so anyway, because I think this, if there's one thing that this pandemic has really shown up, it's the fact that even in Europe, even with the commission and the, all the harmonization that we're supposed to have in Europe and, you know, one little virus and it's all gone wrong. Um, and we're all deharmonized and everyone's doing different things. And I think uh, that can't be good for the consumer. I think more harmonization. Um, but I would not have predicted that, that this pandemic would cause this degree of chaos because I thought actually that for a global emergency like this, I mean, that is why you have the European Commission, that it can guide you through and, and the WHO, that they can guide you through something like this. And what's happened is that all the countries are just doing their own thing. Um, so I, you know, I wouldn't have predicted that. So my predictions aren't worth anything, but um, I, I, I hope, I hope greater harmonization. Diana, 
Daniela, Michael, you will allow me again to go uh, with the ladies first. Well, Daniela, also with your experience of the um, of the European Commission, um, what do you think? Are we going to continue the deharmonizing, or are we going um, to harmonize again and to harmonize even further? Well, I think, I hope personally, the harmonization will continue. But I think that sadly, what this pandemic crisis has shown is that when crises occur, national governments act on their own, uh, which uh, I think it's uh, understandable, but at the same time shows the weakness of the institution, I'm afraid to say. Uh, and that is what has happened, um, one way or another. Uh, and you know, we have been discussing at length, you know, vouchers versus reimbursement. But to put things in perspective, uh, let's think of uh, freedom, you know, free movement of people, and Schengen, and uh, you know, and and health and safety. Uh, you know. People have been stopped at borders and couldn't go back to see their families. Uh, so we are talking about people traveling for, for, you know, for fun, for vacation, but you know, people were just caught into it while in a business trip and family have been apart for three months. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that um, I think even more now, even more than ever, uh, institutions should show their competence and strength to guide through uh, moments of crisis. Uh, otherwise, uh, national uh, not harmonized rules will prevail. And uh, and I think the one that I think the one um, derogation that I felt was the most felt by most. Um, citizens, customers, or however you want to call it, was really the uh, blocker of the block of borders. Uh, you know, I think that was, to me, fundamentally. Uh, you know, we felt back what it was before we had the European Union, and um, and frankly, you know, that should uh, any crisis committee that worked on those issues, I think, would. Uh, probably need to reflect upon that first, um, because starting from the uh, freedom of movement and, uh, and safety of movement, you know, you will then have uh, all the other issues approached, you know, cascading down from that. And I think Alessandra can tell this has also been discussed, right, in the uh, global tourism uh, committee where I mean most of the idea uh, of the ideas are to harmonize uh, and, and also to uh, try to coordinate uh, an international response uh, to the crisis which as we've seen is uh, is very difficult. Michael, um, you you are familiar with the draft convention that you know we worked and IFTA did a lot of work on it and it was a great contributor and I uh, hope very much that uh, IFTA will continue uh, supporting, is, supporting us on this important project. How do you see uh, the future? Are you hopeful as me? Do you think this is going to just, you know, start falling because of the demand of the tourists? Or uh, do you think that we are going uh, to a more deharmonized uh, world in terms of um, consumer protection rights? Uh, I absolutely agree with both Sarah and Daniela that there is a need for more harmonization. Uh, but the problem seems to be, and in particular we saw that on EU level, is that the decision making, the decision process, and the legislation process on supranational or international level is much too slow to react in these kinds of crises. And that's why the, uh, the national states uh, got back to their own decision processes and uh, legislation. So we need to speed up international decisions in order to uh, cope with these kinds of crises. 
Uh, otherwise, we will always have the same picture, uh, national states going back to their own business and doing their own decisions and not waiting for the others, not cooperating with the others. Uh, that's, I think, is one lesson to be learned out of, of the corona crisis. And another lesson perhaps uh, might be that uh, there is still a need of increased uh, consumer protection or tourist protection in some areas, while in un other areas, we might consider that the burden laid on the industry, laid on organizers, laid on carriers is perhaps uh, too much and goes beyond their capabilities. Uh, so we have to find a fair balance and increase some of the consumer rights on the one hand, but maybe take away some of the responsibility which the industry, in fact, cannot comply with on the other hand. I think we can all fully agree, uh, fully agree to that. And, and in that sense, uh, we'll probably also need to review uh, the, the share of responsibilities that had been established in this uh, draft framework convention because it might not be uh, suitable to, uh, to, to the new uh, situation and also to the situation that we're gonna leave uh, now when we resume travel with all these new obligations also for the tourists and also responsibilities even for the tourists uh, in terms of um, traveling and making, making sure they are healthy too, uh, that they don't travel if they should stay in a quarantine. So all of this is also changing a little bit the, the, the rules of the game. But of course, as an international lawyer, I believe very much in international law and uh, and so I I really hope that um, that our member states would be will be willing uh, to use this opportunity to reflect again on uh, on these international standards and to to take them further, uh, as we've already been through the process of the framework convention on tourism ethics, which was our first baby at UNWTO. Um, at least we know what is the 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 road ahead. So uh, it's a long road. Uh, it's a very complex road, and uh, I hope very much uh, that you will be also uh, contributing to it. I thank you very much uh, for the, the for the wonderful presentations and discussions. I think this was really interesting, and uh, it also brought a different perspective, right, Alessandra, to uh, everything that has been discussed in in, in other webinars. I think so, Alicia. I mean, what I really appreciate from uh, from what has been going on, you know, talking about our consumers, the ones that are watching our webinars, is that nowadays we're all on webinars, we're all on, you know, virtual. Uh, we're dying to go back to normality. Like I'm seeing posts of my friends going completely crazy, me included, the first time I could sit outside on a table with uh, two glasses in front of me. Uh, we're all, I think the thrive to go back to normality is what uh, hopefully I, is going to guide also the lawmakers and the stakeholders in the governments to actually try to exactly go into that direction. Um, let me just say that I am joining Alicia in the pleasure and, and the gratefulness for all of you to participate in this uh, webinar. I do understand that, you know, with Povar is where sort of the pioneers were the ones that are opening the road. And I really do hope, Alicia, that this conversation as well, even virtually, can contaminate, to use some medical terms, also other regions of it our- It will continue, uh, it will continue indeed in other regions. Good, good. And, uh, uh, because as Michael was also recalling, I mean, different regions and different areas of the world have different needs. Harmonization is one of these com concepts that allow me to be you know, uh, as, as, as uh, with long experience of, of this industry, is one of these words that I've been hearing recurringly, you know, is one of these words that we all want to put on our wall behind us, something that is close to peace and, you know, freedom. And, you know, that is one of a sought after concept. But let's also be all aware that, as I was saying before, Tourism specifically requires a level of interaction that no other industry set. It's not an A to B, B to A industry. 
is an industry where if there's you don't have all the pieces and places in all the parts of the world, it will be very, very difficult to restore not only the confidence, but also the sustainability, which is, of course, in the tripartite way that we look at it, to me now is mainly in economic sustainability, because if there's no future for this industry, definitely we wouldn't be talking that long and that much. So it's true that we need to find, I would add another level, if you allow me, Alicia, to this discussion, which we need to harmonize, we need to balance. So this is where I think your job becomes even more difficult because you're the ones that need to make sense out of all this. And uh, I, once again, would like to thank all of you. Thank Academy for allowing us for the extra 15 minutes, academic 15 minutes, but I entirely claim responsibility for this. I wouldn't want this to end. So thank you all very much for your availability. Oh and God. I mean, also thank everybody for attending that is watching us either now or on a replay when they, our audience keeps on growing, especially you know, with time. Quovat is, has, has proven to be a very good platform for a lot of uh, subjects. And let me use this opportunity to just anticipate that on Friday, we're gonna continue with the difficult subjects and we're gonna move on to statistics. We're gonna talk about measuring sustainable tourism with some of the best statisticians in the world headed by our own uh, status, head statistician, which is Hernan Epstein. So we will be receiving an invitation soon, all of you as well. If you don't want to, if you have nothing to do on a Friday, join us for a beautiful statistical webinar. And thank you very much, everybody. And really, I think that is just the beginning. And as the Latin used to say, Daniela, I think you would join me in this. Ad maiora. Yeah? Ad maiora. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.